Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Synthetic Intelligence Forum online. My name is Vic. I'm the host of uh, the session today. And I'm very happy to be welcoming in a few minutes to our live stream uh, a friend and an industry colleague, Ron Bodkin from the Vector Institute and the Schwartz Reisman Institute uh, uh, in Toronto. Uh, Ron's going to talk about a very interesting project that uh, is ongoing at the Vector Institute titled Project Pensive uh, Using AI to Increase Human Agency. And we really want to hear from uh, Ron uh, into this very innovative application of AI for good. Uh, in that same theme of AI for good, I've received quite a few requests from uh, our community members. They want to hear from thought leaders about uh, the link between AI and sustainability, AI and the sustainable development goals. So fortunate enough to have uh, confirmed a presenter in two weeks from now, uh, Ricardo Vinuesa from the KTH Royal Institute of Technology, uh, associate professor there and vice director of the KTH digitalization platform. Uh, most recently, uh, one of the primary authors of a paper that was published in Nature Communication titled something along the lines of role of AI in achievement of sustainable development goals. So this is an important topic for our community members uh, and definitely stay tuned for this session as it goes live in about two weeks. So very soon we'll now get started with the session with Ron. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Synthetic Intelligence Forum online. My name is Vic, and I'm very happy to welcome an industry colleague and a, and a friend to the forum today, Ron, by popular uh, request. This is the second time that Ron has come to the uh, to the forum. And today, Ron will talk about a very interesting project that is ongoing at the Vector Institute titled Project Pensive, Using AI to Increase Human Agency. So without further ado, Ron, I'd like to welcome you to the live stream, and your slides are on. So please take us away, Ron. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Vic. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been about a year since I was last here and I had just started at the Vector Institute. Um, and in that time, very excited about uh, progress we've made both at Vector and at Schwartz Reisman um, in, in our collaboration. Um, this, uh, I'll tell you more about this project. More broadly at Vector, of course, we're vested in world-class AI research and transferring it for social good, for uh, economic development, in, in Canada and in Ontario in particular, and uh, to drive health outcomes. I mean, at Schwartz Reisman, we really think about an interdisciplinary perspective of how to make sure that technology is landing in a positive way, a beneficial way in society with a focus on AI. Um, in fact, this project came about, um, uh, there are a number of antecedents, uh, a lot of interest in responsible AI, you know, we're very, we started a discussion group on better objectives for AI systems, and you'll hear some motivation on why we did that. Um, which led us to say, what are some concrete things we can do to really demonstrate what's possible and contribute to this area? Um, there's also been some great research um, in this area at Vector and Schwartz Reisman, such as Elliot Krieger and, and Rich Semmel's group uh, doing work on uh, recommender systems and Ashley Anderson's uh, done some great work on recommendation systems and on uh, on ways of uh, modeling embeddings in communities, which in fact we leveraged. So without, with that little bit of background, let me um, talk a little bit about what some of our engineering team, including a couple of talented summer interns did uh, to kickstart Project Pensive. So I'm gonna start by giving you a little bit of background on the project. Then I'm gonna show you a live demo. So fingers crossed the demo gods are uh, in our favor today. Um, then having shown you the demo, I'll explain a little bit about what you saw and how it works. And then I'll draw some conclusions and leave time at the end for q and I'd love to hear from you and get your feedback. So broadly speaking, recommender systems, systems, as I'll talk about, that, that suggest what to show people are pervasive. You know, in our increasingly digital world, they're being used, whether it be e-commerce on Amazon, whether it be to recommend, uh, songs, playlists, videos, to order the items in your newsfeed and social media, to suggest videos you might want to watch and streaming services, um, that, or, or even, uh, even in any number of experiences like uh, various curated news experiences like Google and Apple News, right? So recommendation systems have become very central to the way we consume information. And in a, a large internet connected economy, of course, 
uh, the tsunami of available choices in any of these platforms would overwhelm our ability to read through everything. Um, so the, the, the mediation, the, the way of using algorithms to help us navigate uh, the information flow is incredibly important. Um, broadly speaking, a recommender system suggests items that would be useful or valuable to users. Um, sometimes this is defined. In fact, uh, interesting trap, a lot of times um, this is framed, if you look, for example, in Wikipedia, it will say, oh, it's predicting engagement is essentially in the definition. Um, I would argue, and I will argue, that that's in fact um, a flawed way of looking at it, that that creates a lot of problems. But regardless of what, how you prioritize, you're trying to come up with a ranked ordered subset of potential items that are valuable. And most systems today don't do this all in one pass. Instead, there's an initial system that generates candidates. Increasingly, machine learning systems do that, but often there are heuristics or rules at every stage, including, you know, here's some rules like, well, if you're already watching a series, maybe we should throw that in. And here's some trending things that you might find interesting, even though, uh, you know, the, the base model didn't know about them or didn't pr prioritize them. So the candidates get generated and scored um, by a ranking system. And then there's often a re-ranking, which again, new rules or heuristics can come in. And indeed, as we'll see here, Project Pensive and trying to make recommender systems better, in fact, does do work around re-ranking. So with that in mind, broadly speaking, there are a couple of different ways of creating recommender systems. How do you decide on what to recommend? One is called collaborative filtering. And by the way, both of these are not new ideas. Uh, they've been around since at least the 1990s. Uh, people have been working on these kinds of systems in the very earliest days of the internet. I remember when I was at MIT, for example, collaborative filtering, there was a hot startup called Firefly that was pioneering the technology. Uh, but the basic idea of collaborative filtering is you try to recommend items that uh, a person might like by seeing similarity and preferences with other users, right? So you've watched a lot of movies similar to the ones that I've watched. So the fact that you watched a movie I haven't watched is a good indication you might, I might like to watch it. Whereas if there's somebody that has very different tastes, they're watching horror movies and I'm walking, watching documentaries, probably not a lot of uh, similarity. You know, the uh, cosine of our interests in a vector space is basically zero. Right? So that's collaborative filtering. Um, Content-based filtering is instead trying to use the characteristics of the content, the metadata, the topics, the words, the, the date, the language, et cetera, to, uh, to identify what are the characteristics of the things that you would like to read, right? And then recommend those. And in fact, in modern recommender systems in large digital environments, both techniques are used in a combination. So, um, and when we look at the way uh, recommendation systems work in uh, the modern um, large digital systems, they've generally moved to a deep learning model. Now, it's worth saying that in most medium-sized and smaller systems, um, you know, collaborative filtering, linear models, or SVM simpler models are still prevalent. But when you get to big data at internet scale, 100 million user scale, uh, what you'll see is that um, deep learning has taken over because it is producing more accurate results, right? So you'll see a variety of continuous or dense features, you know, about the user, like maybe age or time of day, um, as well as categorical features like their search history or, you know, what, what are the characteristics, the different kinds of topics that a given item might be that get embedded, right? And essentially, these large recommender systems um, have a huge amount of uh, huge vocabulary of things they know about, and they do a lot of work to aggregate that and then ultimately predict things like, will you like or not like, uh, engage or not engage, and use that to essentially rank, right? So there's been work on this, so it's, it's um, oversimplifying to say, but, but you know, not long ago, uh, large uh, recommendation systems were predominantly trying to drive engagement by users, right? And first iteration of that was clicks, and we'll we'll take the story from here. What what goes wrong when you have a recommendation system that's basically trying to optimize engagement, right? So, uh, well, the first thing, no surprise, is if you're just trying to optimize for clicks, 
you get a lot of clickbait, you know, spammy things that sort of get people interested or misrepresenting. So somebody clicks and immediately realizes this is not of interest. This is garbage, right? And then go back, right? So while the next thing a lot of uh, online sites did, at least in the content space, um, was to say, well, let's optimize for engagement. You know, there's an exact analogy in e-commerce, right? Clickbaity products that look interesting, but you don't want to buy them. So then it might be instead, you know, predicting purchase rather than click, right? Uh, but it turns out by optimizing for engagement, there's an uh, expression uh, that, that summarizes it. Enragement drives engagement, right? That you get a lot of inflammatory content, right? It turns out that there's been studies that show that conspiracy theories uh, are much more viral and spread much better and get a lot more engagement than actual nuanced facts, right? So, you know, we've seen a pr uh, proliferation of misinformation like, you know, vaccine uh, conspiracies around COVID-19 or, you know, flat earth conspiracies not so long ago, right? And, and looking at how recommender systems are affecting our politics with polarization and filter bubbles, is a non-trivial problem, right? So there's a lot of different views and a lot of studies have been done by social scientists. Reality is that there, the, the information to do deep studies on this, uh, a lot of it is trade secret and hidden. So it's relatively hard to get conclusive answers about these questions. So there are different perspectives that have been published, but um, you know, intuitively uh, there's a lot uh, a reason to worry about focusing on engagement above all else and not balancing some other uh, concerns, right? Likewise, a lot of concerns about radicalization, you know, addiction, depression, even eating disorders, all of which there's been a lot of examples and studies showing how systems that tend to feed on pure engagement tend to drive these negative behaviors. Now, as I say, you know, I think there's been a couple of angles to addressing these problems. Um, you know, and I will get to actually before I talk about this, uh, let me zip ahead to the, the quick point around content moderation, right? So a first line of defense of this is to say, let's let's use AI techniques to try to filter out the things that are really problematic, that are violating our terms of service, right? We we don't want to have uh, hate speech. We don't want to have things that promote violence. We don't want to recruit people for terrorism. You know that, that that you know increasingly, digital platforms have done a lot of work to remove harmful content, right? And in fact, what what's happened is you know starting in the last five years with advances in deep learning techniques that we'll get to, there's been a lot of progress, right? So YouTube since 2017 has been using machine learning to identify potentially harmful content at least flag it for review. Facebook's published a lot recently on you know how they're. Uh, increasingly using machine learning to flag and identify problematic content, even using reinforcement learning to optimize the flow and reduce the vulnerability of the end-to-end -end system with human reviewers. Um, you know, TikTok, Twitter, LinkedIn all talk about how much they're using machine learning. And, you know, it's always a hybrid model where content gets flagged for review by machine learning, but increasingly you know, organizations like Facebook are prioritizing the queue based on machine learning rules that identify risk as well as things like virality, right? So at this point, it's fair to say that analyzing content, analyzing text, analyzing images, analyzing videos is widely used for the purpose of filtering the worst items out. And that's great. But if we go back to our point around problems from engagement focused recommenders, you have two things that go on here that are challenging. One is that there's always a, a threshold of what is the thing that is just below the line of violating terms of service. And those things can still do a lot of harm and drive a lot of engagement. Now, there's been progress even on that in the sense that uh, in the last two, two years, roughly, it's gained a lot of prevalence to demote in recommendations the worst content, right? So again, the same content approach uh, of, of reducing the voice of misinformation or, or, or borderline uh, violative content. But nonetheless, I would contend that there's still uh, a lot of these problems persist, that a lot of content that is challenging or that people find difficult or, or is not civil, is not appealing, is still out there. And, and, and I would argue that uh, you know, the challenge is 
you can't get much further by you know blocking content or not recommending it to all. Instead, uh, what's needed is more agency or control for users, and we'll talk about that. So, oops, going the wrong way here. So broadly, what what we see happening is you know if you think of AI alignment, this is basically saying how do we make sure an AI system aligns with our values and the valuables of the values of the people who it represents. In the case of recommendation systems, this is really about how do we make sure that what recommenders are doing align with the goals and values of the, the users, and there are a variety of users, society as a whole, and the designers, right? So can they present an editorial voice? Can they give more agency to those who are viewing content, right? And I think a lot of times too, there's a lot of value in, in allowing us to separate our momentary interest of what is it that we think we want to see right now versus what do we think we should be doing? What's our intention, right? So, you know, there's a reason that, you know, a lot of people don't stock their cupboards with junk food because they'll be tempted to eat it, right? It's like, maybe I want to eat healthy and I won't buy junk food, so I'm not tempted. In the same way, if I can tell a recommender, here are the kind of things I actually want to see, I'll be less drawn in to, uh, to, to looking at content that might be problematic, right? So how do we think about driving more alignment of recommendation systems? There's a lot of ways to do it. You know, the, the, one of the ideas that's come out obviously over time is the idea of, well, we should give users more control over what recommenders are producing. And there's a lot of logic to that. Um, the, uh, the general view inside the industry is that users don't use recommender user controls, right? That they get less than 1% of users really use them. And this is a, a series of recent examples of some of what's being offered. So on the left, Facebook will let you right click on a post and, you know, among the options you have uh, hide post and see fewer posts like this. Um, the problem is, you know, as a user, when you click on something like that, you really have no idea what that's going to do, right? How will it change my feed? What will it do? Is this going to actually improve the quality of my recommendation? Um, in a similar way, Twitter, at least for a little while, was testing dislikes on replies on iPhones. I, I managed to screen grab it while it was live, although I haven't seen it lately. Again, you know, what's your motivation to do this? Is it really going to help? And on the right is an example of a different theme of user control, which is you know, YouTube, but also apparently Facebook and others are putting surveys up periodically for users to say, tell us if you like this recommendation, rate it, tell us why, right? Again, you know, like, uh, users are rarely motivated. The perceived effort for this often is high, and it's not clear what you're getting back. Now, I guess our thesis in, in Project Pensive is that, that it's not that giving more user control over recommenders is, is a problem. Uh, instead, what, what it is is that the, the level of control is not sufficient to really allow users to have meaningful impact. So our idea is taking the idea of content moderation working and saying, can we apply it to give users more control? As background, what's been happening in language models is there's been rapid progress. Uh, big progress in the concept on the right of transformers, which really do a great job of letting you take a corpus of text and pick the interesting parts out to attend to the, the piece that's relevant. This has led to an explosion in the size of models that you can see in the, the bottom left, you know, with GPT-3 being one entry. Subsequently, there have been bigger language models have been trained, but um, GPT-3 is still one of the more interesting ones. And the chart on the top left simply shows you how from the time that BERT, which was first really prominent transformer-based model, came out for language models, you rapidly had significant improvement in many tasks, such as question answering, in this case, it's Quad 2.0, where uh, the, the language models are now able to exceed human performance. That's not to say that language models are truly exceeding human performance in all aspects, right? They still have drawbacks, but they've improved a lot. And there's a lot of opportunity to leverage them to really guide and help users, um, you know, especially in a condition where you're looking at, can I probabilistically change the mix? Can I catch a lot of things in the case of content moderation, there are violations. But in, in our case, we're going to say, can I really, as a user, express an intention about the kind of things that are interesting to me or important to me and change the way a feed for social media will work for me that, that really gives me more control? So with, with that in mind, you know, we, we're looking at how do we 
create? How do we use these AI tools that are now available? Language models, you know, multimodal training in future to, to feed in images and videos to give people an ability to set higher level constraints on what they're interested in. Can they, can they select for a certain level of civility, you know, objectivity as opposed to subjectivity in the way things are written, diversity of viewpoint, diversity in, in, in content, various topics of interest, right? So leveraging these advances, we want to let users have more control over what they see and how they see it. Um, and, and users, you know, the first view of this, and we'll focus in the demo on what does a, a reader, a consumer see, but it's just as important for editors, for platforms, either of which can set editorial voice. You know, this could create a, 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 the, the same way that playlists allow curation and feeding. You could have uh, those who would create a business or offer a kind of packaging of ideas that, that would let others view content in a way, you know, in a semi-automated way. And indeed, that, that can empower creators as well. Um, and, you know, broadly, we think that democratizing access to these machine learning techniques in this arena of content analysis is powerful, right? That there's been a lot of progress that's been made in applying language models and multimedia models in content moderation, but there's been a few papers, but very little implementation. So open sourcing, sharing, making it more available. We'd like to see broader use of these techniques in a wider range of audiences. So with that in mind, let's turn to a demonstration. So I'm going to switch screens to a live demo. And let me now instead share my browser that's connected to, I have a, um, a the, the model running on our GPU cluster at Vector. Um, and this is a screen that we use to create uh, the demonstration. So this is created by our interns this summer, Jean Tuso and Michael Nicello. Um, so I'm gonna demonstrate how we can actually use um, these AI analysis techniques to help you better navigate a social feed. You know, this is taking uh, some examples. We found a public data set from Reddit of sarcastic comments. Sarcastic comments are interesting because they tend to be a little bit edgier and, and you have more, uh, more ability to then test out some of the different uh, characteristics like civility, right? So these are just some examples of different comments. And to start with, let's just test out the civility filter that we have in place. So we'll start with something that's pretty uncivil. Uh, you know, if uh, if I say somebody, if I insult somebody and attack their, oh shoot, uh, okay, well, I the demo gods are not smiling on me. Let me see what's going on here. Uh, I'm still connected. Let me try uh, going to um, my uh, other session. Uh, I swear it was. Doesn't everyone say this when they're doing demos? I swear it was working a minute ago. Um, so let's see here. Um, now we're back on um, back on the other demo server we have up and running. Um, let's try again that same statement. And you can see that indeed um, saying what idiocy you're a jerk is pretty toxic. It's an uncivil comment, right? Probably should be filtered out if I'm looking for more civil comments. I don't want to see insults. Here's something that's a little more uh, intermediate. I totally disagree with your rant. It's considered civil, but you can see its toxicity score is still moderate, right? It's about one third from not toxic. Now, if I change my language a little bit and say, I respectfully disagree with your position, now that goes down to a quite civil comment of 0.06. It's still got disagree, but it's still, you know, it's much lower, right? So you can see that this model roughly has the ability to distinguish among different levels of civility in language. Now for the next thing, we're gonna look at the diversity filter. So what, what we're gonna do, we, we can do this for comments within a thread, but I find it's a little easier to actually see it um, within, um, a, uh, within uh, a recommending subreddits as a whole. So we implemented both of those. In this case, um, let's pick um, 
let's pick the world news Reddit. So what this is doing, this bounded greedy selection is starting from this, it's finding similar subreddits to this one, but it, what it's trying to do is take, um, take essentially uh, within the top most similar ones, it's ordering them to create more diversity across the list, right? So in other words, um, it, it picks for relative diversity to say, I don't want to have a lot of things that are all in the same space. I want things that are, you know, within the top recommended that, that have some varieties, right? So, you know, subreddits like one about Palestine, one about advertising, Australia, the crown on Netflix, the environment, right? So you can see that it's done a pretty good job of diversifying the feed um, versus um, we, we don't see here what the regular one is, but it was assessed to be about 70% more diverse, right? So it's giving a pub, bubbling up to the top of the list things that are more diverse. Um, you know, we implemented another algorithm uh, called, uh, that's called um, topic diversification, but I won't show you that. Instead, let's put it all together. Uh, so let me just add a few more posts to this just to give you a little bit more of a flavor. So what we're gonna do now, and this may take a minute because it's gotta load some data and um, it also um, is a little slow because um, running, as we'll see, actually running these large language models chews up some processing. So it's gonna take a little time, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna combine civility filtering and diversity. So what this will do when we, we do this is we're looking for a given user. Um, in this case, we picked one, Biffingston, who's one of the more prominent posters in, in the Reddit data set we have and in the subreddit politics and saying, we want to come up with a set of recommended content that this user might find interesting. So now what we'll do is we'll apply a civility filter and a diversity filter. Um, so just we'll click generate feed once so that it lets us, it prompts us for Initially, it will just apply a civility filter. Then we can go back and, and pick a different diversity filter than none. So this will let us compare the results. So it's running right now, as you can see. And what we'll look at here when it comes out is to say, you know, what is, how is it assessing the civility of the comments? And an in, interest in will show us on the bottom the things it filtered out that were considered uncivil, um, which gives an idea of how in practice we're able to remove posts that are not considered uh, civil. So as a, a reader, I can avoid reading those comments and focus on ones that are more respectful. So we'll give this a minute to run. Um, and um, when that's done, um, we can look through um, while we're waiting for it. Um, Vic, I can't hear uh, you. I think you were Ron? saying something. Yes, uh, while you're waiting for that language model to finish running, can I ask a question? There's an, uh, a question yeah. that came in from the audience. Uh, do the two filters tend to be contradictory to each other? It's a good question. I would say no. In fact, the way they, um, the, they work, it, civility is currently implemented as simply as a filter. You, you set a level for how civil something should be. And diversity is instead a re-ranking rule, right? So it changes the order of things in ranking. So they're, they're, they're somewhat orthogonal and complementary. Now there's lots of ways you can combine and use them, right? Like instead of absolutely filtering, you could boost or demote things based on civility as well, right? So you could, you could combine them, but, but in practice, diverse topics by content tend to not be uh, correlated with uncivil comments. So here's an example of the feed uh, that was ranked. Most of the comments here were deemed not toxic. Some are moderately toxic, but we can zoom in on things like, um, you know, this, uh, the, these two comments, uh, I'm not gonna read them out, but um, are deemed to be toxic, right? Talking about fools and hypocrisy and, you know, uh, potentially anti-Semitic comments and, and talking about Hitler. So. Certainly, um, certainly, you can see why these, the model filtered those as, as potentially, um, you know, as, as looking toxic. Um, and so you can see, you can see that. We, why don't we just quickly run it once more? But this time, we'll pick um, a diversity uh, algorithm. So this will now give us a chance to re-rank the the the. Uh, 
not by, you know, by using the bounded greedy selection algorithm, again, going through and making sure that the first comments are a little uh, more varying in their, their nature. So you see more of a sampling of different kinds of conversation, right? So when you would come into your, oops, I shouldn't have clicked, I think. Uh, here we go. I'll run it again. Um, so, you know, the, the idea here is when a user would come in, it would be nice to get, you know, a variety of different kinds of things that are in their feed. Certainly, I'd like to see something like that. You know, when I go into, say, Twitter, uh, I'd like to see, you know, here are a few different topics that are bubbling up in my feed rather than perhaps 20 people are talking about the, the, the thing du jour and you have to scroll down to find interesting, the next interesting topic, right? So we'll, we'll look at this and we'll see. I think um, this will reorder versus not having diversity and we'll actually see some different comments that were toxic as well as how the model scored itself in terms of how it improved uh, the diversity of commentary. So we'll give this a minute. And again, and this is uh, going through and applying um, the two different language models on the top. And in this case, you know, we're, we're taking a, a larger list of comments and then, you know, for this user in the subreddit and then you know, ranking the ones that are the most aligned to the interest of this user to then let us go through and filter for civility and then re-rank based on diversity. Um, so uh, we'll let that run. Uh, when that's done, what I'm going to do is is give you a, a bit more of an overview of the model. Um, you know, essentially, okay, here we go. So here's, here's a recommended feed. And you can see that um, this is, you know, a bit more diverse in the sense it's talking about athletes and artificial intelligence and, and characters. And so, you know, it's definitely got a little bit more variety. It's also interesting that there was a lot more toxic comments. So <laughs> to the earlier question, in this case, there was more toxic content that came up by promoting diversity because we bubbled, bumbled into perhaps more toxic um, topics. This first one had been there before. Um, but, you know, here's another one talking about playing people for idiots, um, you know, uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that are coming across. And at the same time, you can see that it's, it's a lot of judgment call, right? Like is, uh, saying the most pointless, useless thing they could possibly spend their time doing. Well, that's not super civil, right? It's certainly insulting and inflammatory. Anyway, you get the idea. So this is a little bit of a flavor of how we're we're able to implement these techniques. So let me uh, let me then go back to the slides and tell you a little bit more about what we've seen, and then uh, we'll uh, go back uh, to make sure there's time for some more questions at the end. So let's talk about this, right? The architecture we trained, uh, we came up with basic embeddings um, from the sarcastic comments data set. Uh, Reddit, which is user, which has the user ID, the subreddit, and the comment, and we learn embeddings both for the words and for the users, right? So basically, what are their interests? What are the characteristics of the words or the the, the sentences actually um, that that are uh, that come out from the comments? And so we basically look at um, cosine similarity in in um, embedding space between a user in subreddit and the various comments to generate the the most prominent or interesting candidates right so that that comes up with our initial ranking then the way we we process is we've trained the separate the separate civil model we took a fine tuning data set for civility and I'll tell you more about that in a little bit that is then used to train a civility model and that's used to filter so any comment, any comments that were deemed too uncivil get removed. And then things are re-ranked based on whatever diversity algorithm, like bounded greedy search, starting with the seed uh, posting. We then pick the next one in the top candidates that is uh, maximizes, you know, in a greedy way, diversity of postings. Right. So that's that's broadly how it works to then produce recommended comments. If we look at the civility filter, um, it was built on distill BERT, which is um, a distilled version of BERT that's basically a little smaller and runs faster, right? We wanted to optimize for runtime. Um, it was fine tuned on a civil comments data set. Um, this was curated by uh, Jigsaw, which is part of uh, Google's parent company, Alphabet. 
uh, and, the, and used to train their perspective API, which is used for moderating content online. So it's a somewhat similar use case, right? It has labels for that the people have assessed toxicity, severe toxicity, and other characteristics. Um, and then we basically were able to use Hugging Face um, to wrap the Stilbert um, to train a predictor of uncivil comments. For diversity, um, we use a language uh, model, the sentence transformer. In this case, you can see paraphrase mini LM L6V2 is the exact one, which creates semantic embeddings for the comments um, to, to basically embed you know, the overall comment. And then we can look at the similarity of the content of the comments in embedding space to, to try to maximize um, difference among comments while still ensuring that they are similar to the interests of those comments. So there are two of them, you know, and, and I will share links with you. You can read more about them offline, bound gritty and topic diversification. So the net net at inference time, the way this works is we take in the embedding vectors and we cross them with the embeddings for comments. And that lets us produce matching scores that can be you know, for a given user's interest or you know, for a given subreddit um, to say, you know, what are the, the best scoring candidates? And then they get filtered based on the Distilbert model um, to filter out toxic content. And they get re-ranked uh, to if if appropriate if we're looking at diversity, and so that is the net net of how uh, what you've seen here today works. You know, we we did do some analysis since the civility filter is based on uh, the training data that the perspective API used, and in fact, what we found is you know pretty similar kind of performance, right? And in, in as you can see for low, medium, and high toxicity examples um, that, that that tend to be uh, reasonably consistent in viewing them. Um, as you can see, uh, it's not perfect, right? In the last example, um, it's something offensive, but um, it doesn't, hasn't picked up on an attempt for a person to uh, evade being caught for saying something offensive, right? So there's not on every case is it going to work. Um, you know, there's a bit of cat and mouse. And the other thing that's worth noting that we didn't do, but would, would also be important to do is there's been work in the perspective API to address some of the unfair bias that's embedded in toxic comments. Unfortunately, certain, uh, certain groups are often victimized in online fora, and therefore there can be discriminatory bias against those victim groups. Their, their identity characteristics are used as insults and the models without correction uh, tend to uh, you know, penalize them. So that's certainly another area to to watch and and to address. I know that I think there's been some good work in perspective and similar work would be valuable to do before applying this model as well. Um, overall, you can see that the F1 scores are amazingly similar between the models. And one thing I thought was interesting is that essentially using the training data set, but you know, modern language uh, models, the ease of Doing fine tuning with PyTorch and with uh, and with Hugging Face, we're able to achieve, uh, you know, in a summer intern project, a similar kind of performance to what Jigsaw produced. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, we're excited to carry forward to, to get a first release out uh, with the idea of engaging the community, and getting more feedback, and there's so many directions to go. You know, I'm excited uh, about a collaboration um, with. Uh, it's uh, some of our researchers on integrating Pensive with conversational AI to say, you know, if somebody's giving information about what they want recommendations on, can you give qualitative guidance like less violent or more kids friendly, as well as more direct topical things like recommend, you know, movies or comedy movies. Um, there's tons more opportunity uh, to address, uh, improve the analysis, not only correcting for bias, but also looking at other characteristics like objectivity, reflectiveness, viewpoint diversity, topics, you know, blending image and video, um, combining, how do you combine these different analytic techniques? Um, and you know, there's been a lot of work on these techniques, but so much is advanced in terms of language models, even ideas like integrating common sense into language models and more sophisticated pre-training and multitask training, right? There's lots of ways of applying recent advances of AI to improve this. 
just as important, I think, will be tools to allow live feedback and use, right? Can you visualize uh, how recommenders might change and, and opt for different preferences? Can you allow for active learning so users can give feedback and improve real time the kind of algorithm? Uh, another thing that you may have thought of as you were waiting for the demo, I certainly did, is how to speed things up, right? So recent advances in faster language models like Longformer or Linformer that basically approximate transformers with less work could, could be useful to make this more practical um, at scale. Um, I also think it's incredibly important to have more standardized evaluation suites to encourage more research, right? I mean, what, what you really notice is that these kinds of tasks, applying content analysis to, to give users agency is not widely studied. There's the occasional uh, paper, the occasional use, but it's not up there with you know, answering questions where there's hundreds of benchmarks and thousands of papers, right? So it would be great if we could increase visibility and make it more of a priority for researchers to look at how uh, all these great advances in AI techniques could allow users to get more control over what they see, you know, and that naturally leads to real world experimentation, right? Whether it be through third party add-ons that make it possible in a browser or otherwise to change what you see or to filter or digest or through partnerships. Right, so there's lots of exciting directions and certainly we're excited to explore all of the above and to continue to advance the project. So in conclusion, recommender systems are increasingly central to our digital life and we think it's important to give users agency to use AI techniques that have become mainstream for moderation, but to make them available to empower users. Right? I think that's a really important part of the bigger question of how do we make AI systems better serve our values is to, to give higher level controls and to use AI uh, feedback on AI systems, right? So I think that it's exciting, right? We're excited we've open sourced the project, it's still a uh, minimum viable product incubating project, but you can go to our GitHub, uh, Vector Institute's project Pensive to see it. Uh, feel free to connect with me on Twitter, would love to hear from you. And I've put a bit.ly link uh, for these slides if you're interested. And with that, that gives us a few minutes here at the end for any questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ron, for an excellent uh, presentation, uh, just like the previous time. And as somebody who, uh, in a previous role, used to present uh, numerous enterprise systems demos, I, I you did a great job with doing that live demo. I, I remember that uh, I used to think a hundred things need to go right for it to go right, but one thing needs to go wrong for it to come completely unstuck. And you did a phenomenal job. You mentioned the GPU cluster. Is that is that the rack behind you, Ron? We see with the transparent white. Uh, screen is the uh, the transparent screen is that your gpu rack right behind you uh, no no that's just my home office um, our our gpus are sitting in, in a data center um, at Cynet. and we have about a thousand gpus that support researchers in use and uh, we have a nice system where we can spin them up for interactive use like for this demonstration that's excellent, Ron. That's great. Uh, you touched briefly around the middle slides. You touched on reinforcement learning, and one of your slides talks about the notion of feedback and feedforward kind of learning. Can you touch a little bit on that, Ron? Have you, uh, perhaps in your experimentation, when you saw certain comments being ranked and scored in certain ways, uh, was, was then the interaction of users with that then used to retrain the models or recalibrate the models? How do you see reinforcement learning in the real world fitting into the CI, CD aspects of this tool? in the wild yeah i think it's a great future direction right so what what we saw is facebook has talked about how they're using reinforcement learning to shorten the cycle times um, in in detecting content that violates their terms of service right like hate speech right to be able to have faster feedback on the kinds of things that are actually bubbling up to be problems right um now implementing tools like project pensive in 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 real world systems, you know, with partnerships, you could imagine doing that on more generally human in the loop ways of gathering feedback and, and having even just regular retraining cycles, right? So I think the first human in the loop steps would be, you know, more selectively asking users for feedback on specific items, um, as well as uh, you know, regular retraining in a supervised learning model. But it, you know, certainly as there's more data, you know, applying reinforcement learning techniques could be interesting too. 
Interesting. That that's great, Ron. Uh, in terms of another future direction, Ron, have you thought about perhaps uh, taking this notion of the civility filter and the diversity filter and applying that into a different context, such as machine translation, where you can now start doing culturally aware, values aware forms of translation that then do the not just the transliteration, but in fact they apply the notion of civility and diversity as you go from one language to another language, uh, source to death target. Yeah, I mean certainly. We'd love to see you know people coming with all kinds of great ideas for how to use these tools, right? So you know, as open source, we'd welcome contributions and tests. Like in your example, can can it be helpful in 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 giving you different choices of translations in terms of diverse content? You know, if you had some different ones, or you know, removing uncivil, uh, you know, is this kind of a safety valve on uh, translations that might not land because they're they, they could be misinterpreted um in fairness um you know the, the, at this point the civility filter is um trained on english right and the, predominantly the data is english so i think there's generally work on uh and good work to do on multilingual uh to better support for other languages is important as well um and in fact i think there's a lot of other use cases right another one that uh that i see is a lot a lot of interest in is a lot of the same kind of analysis of the characteristics of content can be very relevant for things like advertisers trying to say like we don't want to be putting our ads on content that doesn't you know mirror our values or interests right and so you know another you know way of of having that kind of brand safety tools but using ai techniques to identify areas where your ads are, are running that you're 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 giving voice and and credence to uh, offensive points of view or ones you don't share, you know, I think again, like having more control, these tools can also be really valuable for that. I've seen some studies that show that uh, the day's tools that are available widely commercially tend to be pretty simple keyword based tools and, and often miss the mark. Like I know they were filtering a lot of ads running on COVID content because it would talk about killing the virus, right? And like, oh, that's bad. <laughs> it was sort of mainstream news. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of ways that these techniques, I, mean, I think broadly making good content analysis, uh, for making judgment and curating is, is valuable in many contexts. Okay, that's great, Ron. Another question that comes to mind has to do with uh, how enterprises would scale Project Pensive in their in their organizations. So it is open source, and so you do you've encouraged organizations to contribute. Now, when organizations download this, do you envision them running this in their own cloud somewhere, or will you plan to actually host this uh, for organizations to subscribe to it in some way? Yeah, so we uh, we're, we don't offer. Uh, online services at Vector, right? So what our model is, is we will publish the open source and we want to help people use it, right? Certainly in our community, we have, we've been doing collaboration projects, you know, and courses, both with sponsors, with small and medium enterprises, you know, we, uh, we're, we're starting to do more hackathons, um, but it's, it's open source that's designed so it could be run in a variety of places, right? It could be run in any number of public clouds. It could be run with on-premise infrastructure, hybrid cloud, right? And we, we definitely leverage and integrate with other great open source like PyTorch and Hugging Face, right? So we make it easier to adopt and use in the tool chain. Um, and, and certainly, you know, I think one of the things that, that we wanna do is we wanna keep publishing out tutorials and notebooks and make it easier and easier to use. Okay, great. Uh, here's an excellent question too, Ron. Uh, have you considered instead of filtering uncivil comments out, rephrasing them in a more appropriate way? Yeah, it's a great question, right? And and then that, that's a very um, you know, th that that comes up in other topics too. Like one that we haven't implemented yet, but I'd love to to see is uh, similar. There's been recent research on uh, using wiki edits to find you know what are more objective or subjective phrasings. And again, there's models that can can also come up with more objective ways of phrasing things um, and i guess the question is um is um if you're presenting somebody's opinion to other people is kind of editing it um to be more civil or more uh, objective is that sort of a good thing to do um you know i i can certainly see the person who posts that feeling like uh, I'm losing my voice. I'm being sort of, you know, censored or or edited or or, or or modified. So so it's it's a good question, right? Like, is that 
that that one is a much harder question in my mind as to whether that's the right experience and whether that's what people should do. Um, you know, the place I would actually, you know, as I think about it, the place I'd like to see that more is maybe maybe as guidance for somebody before they post, right? Before they put something, it's like, have you considered rephrasing this? How about saying this? <laughs> So, you know, I'd be happier if it were sort of an opt-in that the person posting gets a, a nudge, just like, you know, there's been progress on avoiding sharing this information by saying like, have you read this article? Maybe you should read it before you share it, right? Like, so in the same way, I think using these tools to help people who are posting be more thoughtful is a great suggestion. Uh, thank you, Ron. Uh, so here's another interesting comment, which has to do with the fact that it's a prototype. And as I asked before, Ron, you know, for enterprises to truly scale this in a production uh, scale, if you will, production level, uh, when we think about the economics of these prediction machines, you mentioned, Ron, that you have a pretty large uh, compute cluster, and even then it takes some time, and there's a lot of heavy duty number crunching going on under the hood. So have you maybe looked into sort of the, the conversation that always happens, Ron, in the CSR, uh, corporate social responsibility space on value versus values, which is certainly everybody would like to have this kind of a civility filter and a, and a diversity filter in their recommender systems. The question is, uh, incrementally over the cost of just having a recommendation period versus a civil and diverse recommendation. Uh, has there been any kind of economic modeling? Is that something that you'd look into given that that is something that organizations would have to really think about if they are to do this seriously and at scale? Well, to be clear, this demo is running on a single T4 GPU. So we only allocated one GPU. Okay. <laughs> so it's not using a whole cluster um, to start. Um, the second thing I would say is, you know, I think it's very encouraging that uh, you know, when you when you look at uh, Facebook pointing to how they implemented an efficient transformer architecture, Linformer for content moderation, think about the scale that they're operating and the number of things that they have to put push through models, right? So, uh, you know, I think the good news is that the capacity of these models um, you know, the, to, is quite high and there's been some great optimization. So I think it's very feasible to scale the work um, but, you know, I wouldn't say that at this point where we've optimized the system, right? I mean, at this point, we're still sort of in demonstration of feasibility with the idea that, you know, it's worth testing. But I think there's good precedent that you can make these systems work well. And there's a lot of smart things you can do in terms of caching and pre-computing, right? So net net is what you would like to do is compute embeddings once and work on embeddings rather than recompute them dynamically, right? And and so in practice, almost everybody that's that's working with embeddings uses that kind of an architecture. So, you know, I think we'd certainly love to talk to people that are interested about like how do you actually make this work more efficiently for real world use cases. Uh, but I think there's a lot of promise in that direction. Okay, thank you, Ron. That's uh, that's great insight and great foresight. And uh, we're at the top of the hour. So on behalf of the community, I'd like to thank you for sharing your time and your insights. And we'd love to have you back in a couple of months to showcase maybe some other uh, interesting and innovative projects uh, that you're working on at the Vector Institute and at Schwartz Reisman. So thank you for your time, Ron. And uh, we'll hope to have you back in the forum very soon. Thanks. It's been great being here. And thanks for all the great questions. Bye thank now. you. Bye for now. Bye, everybody.